<laughs> Good morning. You're watching the morning show here on Arise News. I'm Diola Labi. Good morning. I'm Veronica Odeka. Good morning. And I'm Tundu Abiela. Before we get right into the discussion with Peter Esele, let's listen to this short video titled Government and Labor Tensions and the People. Let's take a look. Nigeria's economy remains enmeshed in an unending labor crisis following the ongoing strike and backed upon by university teachers on the platform of the Academic Staff Union of Universities. Coming less than two weeks after the country's organized labor went back on a proposed nationwide strike, which it had planned to be the mother of all strikes, the current state of affairs continues to highlight the widening gap in trust between the Nigerian government and its labor force. Even as the federal government hesitates on putting a seal on the new minimum wage figure of 30,000 Naira and with the economy hovering around dangerous levels of recession, the general outlook offers little room for optimism. Many economy watchers share the view that the struggle for a living wage for Nigerian workers has barely started and is only rebuting for a more violent expression sometime in the near future. The plight of the average Nigerian in all of these regardless of who is right and who is wrong, continues to create a big moral dilemma for a country where economic odds are already heavily stacked against the poor and helpless. Nigerians, irrespective of social and economic standing, are still subject to the same economic realities, the same forces of demand and supply in an open market where the national currency, the Naira, has almost become a byword for inflation. What then is the government of the day and even the labor unions doing to shield the long-suffering Nigerian worker from the uncertainties of these troubled times? The answer to that question may be long in coming, given that Nigerian politicians have practically thrown governance to the dogs and are right now only preoccupied with reversed mandate from the people. The oil and gas sector dictates the heartbeat of the Nigerian economy. Um, to know, I think I, this is just... <laughs> Little surprise then that the government and its agents are always prompt in attending to matters that have the potential of, dis of disrupting the smooth running of that sector. But even at that, it's never smooth running all the time. Labor union activities are usually a bit more sensitive here, perhaps a function of Nigeria's status as a monoproduct economy. It then falls on labor leaders in the sector to ensure a balance between satisfying the demands of workers and maintaining industrial harmony. One man has played such leadership role in Nigeria's oil and gas sector in the past 15 years is a former president of the Trade Union Congress, as well as the Petroleum and Natural Gas Senior Staff Association of Nigeria, Peter Esele. Mr. Esele, you are welcome to the morning show. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So let's start actually with the immediate constituency, the oil and gas sector. How would you assess and where would you say we are now with the impact of that private, of the private sector players in the oil and gas at this point? I think if, if you are to look at it from productivity level and also how, I, I watched, how the workers feel about maybe their welfare, mm -hmm. I think oil, oil and gas workers are better off than so many other players say. in the yeah. <laughs> what, what I'm saying, what I'm saying that is, I was playing as a president and also TUC president. In, in that in that sector, we can negotiate for six months, but once an agreement is reached, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. it's an home run. What is the? I mean, do, what is what does that look like? Is there a minimum wage in that sector? In, in that sector, what you have is that we don't really have what we call a minimum wage. So you sort of have a fair yes, wage. Yes, what, what we have is first we have to look at what our counterparts are earning in the UK, mm. in the US. We may not get as much as they are going to get, but the bottom line is that we are able to say, okay, they are getting X, and then we look at welfare, we look at some other packages, maybe insurance, healthcare, all of these things are factored in, into our negotiation. And then also look at the environment. So. If, if, if I'm to put the average Nigerian worker, average oil worker, with maybe those in the civil service or in the mm -hmm. other public sector, I think the average oil worker is better off. Mm -hmm. The challenge is in terms of privatization, in terms of investment, in terms, mm -hmm. in terms of looking into the future. What do you want to see in that industry? What do you want to see in that sector? How do you expect? To say, take for example, you've, you've struck oil for over 50 years mm -hmm. and your drilling is still majorly done by 
foreign companies. Mm -hmm. So that in itself is a huge. So challenge. you guys are very focused on that local content. Yes, um, the local content is. Bill it's, and yes. The, okay. What you have in the local content being nice that we have majorly one of the biggest problem we have in Nigeria is not really issue of policy on paper. Mm -hmm. It's the issue of having the discipline mm -hmm. to follow through mm -hmm. on what you have on paper. So why do you think that there is? It, it has to do with uh, it has to do with discipline. Mm -hmm. It has to do with capacity. It has to do with taking decisions without thinking of is it my brother, is it mm -hmm. my sister, and then all of these things play into why we are where we are. Mm -hmm. But that's also why that sector is a little bit above water than every other sector because you have a lot more private players there, and everybody mm -hmm. wants to. Outside of NMPC, if you take for example Shell, Chevron, everybody mm -hmm. wants to be wants to work for those companies because you know there are a lot of private mm -hmm. investment in it, not too much interference from government. So are you comfortable with the level of government interference in the sector? No, because once you have, take for example NMPC, mm -hmm. you have, uh, there was a time I had to cry out that you can't have uh, in 10 years and you have more than six GMDs of NMPC. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not going to work. So what you have is that the, the GMB of NMPC will be loyal to the president yes. instead of to the organization. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because it may just be in the office and it's announced on TV that the GMB of NMPC has been removed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I have had several meetings with some of the GMBs and the next thing is that there's a call from Maserock and, mm -hmm. and one has to cry out and say, this is what I face every day. Mm -hmm. So how will I function? So you have BP, you have ExxonMobil, and you have their bosses stay there for 10 years. Mm -hmm. You have Telesin, who later became Secretary of uh, uh, State in the U.S., was uh, from my ExxonMobil chief. He's been there for years. Mm. So what that does is that you have stability, you have policy trust, and you have gradual planning for, what, for that organization. But that is not what we have there. Mm. That's also why we're a lot more... When you look at... I mean, when you t talk about the, con the, the challenges with an NPC, and there's, of course, been a lot of conversations about reforming and privatizing the Nigerian sector. What, I mean, where do you stand and where does the... Where I, does I, I think the bottom line is, is more government just... Uh, they just talk. Mm. You see, it's just like the way we do in this country. Now somebody says restructuring. Restructuring <laughs> what? There's no foundation, mm -hmm. no substance. Mm -hmm. Government comes on and says, OK, we want to privatize the refinery. We on our own, we've already looked at the refinery, mm -hmm. and we reached out to government and said, government, privatize. Mm -hmm. Now, that was... In the time of Obas and Joe, mm -hmm. we had one thing the union has, which mm -hmm. politicians lack, is that we have we have history. You have my successor now knows what happened before I left, and he followed through. So there's more like a blueprint. Yes. And so we it. said, okay, we all looked at it. These refineries will not run mm -hmm. because of government interference. Why don't we get a cooperator from private sector? We give the cooperator maybe he has a 51 percent, while government has 49 percent. Mm -hmm. We made all of this to government. They did nothing. And then suddenly on his way out, Obasan just said he wants to privatize. And then you have Yaradua comes in, and you have this north and south divide. Oh, you had a certain president for how many years? Suddenly, six months to when he's going, he said he's privatized. So if I'm understanding you right, basically there's a lack of leadership. Yes. yes. There's a lack of leadership yes. to privatize. And a lot of selfish interest, ego, personal interest, mm -hmm. not group interest. So if you, ha if you have group interest, I think refineries would have been privatized long ago. Because there was a time the union virtually gave a go-ahead. Mm -hmm. Even workers in NPC came in our meeting and said, we think, they think it should be privatized. But, so, but everyone thinks it should be privatized. privatized. Everyone yes. has the conversation about privatization. <laughs> there continues to be lack of, lack of leadership and lack of will. Where does that blame squarely land? Of course, it's, it's the government. Mm -mm. Which government? The president, president? the president is the Minister of Petroleum. Mm. So the president is the Minister of Petroleum. So first is that you have to ask the president what is your blueprint for the oil and gas. Mm -hmm. So if his it's, if it's blueprint is privatizing the refineries, if his blueprint is privatizing the oil and gas, mm -hmm. then it, it follows through. That is why he was elected. So mm -hmm. if you are campaigning in other parts of the world, you say, when I become your president or when I become mm -hmm. your governor, this is what I'm going Can to do. One, two, it? three. Mm -hmm. And then when you come in, you drive it through because that is why you were elected for. Mm -hmm. But it is only when you come into power, that is what we have in Nigeria. It's only when people come into power, they start looking for consultants to tell them what to do. They start looking for, and then you have all kind of manner of people bringing proposals to mm. a governor or to a president. That itself is not done anywhere. So if you, 
Now, go back, look at how much have been expended in turnaround maintenance. The average turnaround maintenance of a refinery over the years is nothing less than $200 million. Mm -hmm. So, several money have been injected into those refineries, and you know they are not working. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then do something. So, we just need to think out of the box. But what would you say now to um, presidential aspirant Atiku Abubakar's um, latest manifesto bullet point that he would privatize NNPC? One of the challenges we face, I, I had done similar thing, and I told the president that when President Buhari was also coming up, I was invited by the transition committee, and I said, do one, two, three. And everybody always says, I don't, I don't. I don't always take Nigerian politicians. I'm sorry with all due respect. Mm -hmm. I, I don't take them seriously until I start seeing what they do. Mm -hmm. What a lot of people don't know is that you don't develop, personality don't grow in society. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, the, the way we run our country is that it's built around personality. Mm -hmm. yes. Now you are doing, mm -hmm. uh, the current government is, President Buhari is talking about anti-corruption. Buhari may, may not be corrupt. But what about those around him? Mm. Then you have somebody coming in, even Obasan just eight years, was also built around the personality. It's platform that develops a society. The individual can take you far, but it can never take you to the destination. Mm -hmm. It is only platform that can take you to your destination. Mm -hmm. If I'm in America today, I know what Democratic Party stands for. Mm -hmm. I know what Republican Party stands for. If I'm in the UK, I know what the Conservative stands for. I know what the Labour Party stands for. I'm in Nigeria. I'm finding it difficult to know what APC and PDP stands for. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's very easy for them to migrate. In the morning, PDP. In the evening, <laughs> APC. I, I mean, I have to say, thank you for saying that, because I think this is really a um, <coughs> indictment on the politicians of Nigeria. Yes. And I think at this point, based on some of the conversations We've that have been had. had over the last few months, I think Nigerians are now almost sort of saying, we, if you're going to be in one party, you almost need to sort of have an ideology and be a member of that party. Yes. I think Nigerians are now done with the flip-flopping and sort of the walking back and forth. But one of the things that you've been talking about is sort of the people around, the people and sort of too much power sort of being in the hands of the people. When you look at the Ministry of Petroleum and the Minister of Petroleum, be it the president, be it not the president, and you look at the president, and you look at the opportunity to privatize, the opportunity to actually um, transform the petroleum industry. Do you believe that those, those two roles have too much power when it comes to petroleum, especially the ministry? First thing is, I, I think the president had too much on his table to also not carry the minister of petroleum. Now, the president is supposed to carry out oversight. First is, is how do I put it now? Even the, the law setting up NMPC, you have the Minister of Petroleum, mm -hmm. it's also the chairman of the board of NMPC. Mm -hmm. So where is the checks and balances? Mm -hmm. Ordinarily, what you expect is that the JMD of NMPC and the board of NMPC go, makes, makes up something that they want to do, probably an investment or what they want to do. Then the Minister of Petroleum will now have to oversee it mm -hmm. and then critique it mm -hmm. and see what is best for the country. But where you have the JMD of NMPC sitting in the same board, as the Minister of, of Petroleum, so what you have is that it's likely good, that will not be transparent. So there's a huge yeah. issue around exactly. government. Co corporate, corporate mean, governance. Exactly. Corporate governance, yes. 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 One of the biggest problems we have is the issue of corporate governance. So once you have JMD of NMPC, I'm sitting, I'm sitting on the board, and then <coughs> just take, for example, we are here, and your boss, your boss is here, and then you have a contrary opinion to what your boss is saying, you're not going to say that because you'll be fired. Well, you're exactly. Board, yeah. But the yes. issue is that that was allowed to fly when Buhari mm -hmm. announced that he would be pres Minister for Petroleum, who was applauded at the time, because yes. this did not arise in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. This was the reaction against the rampant corruption of the previous administration. Yes. So at the time we thought, oh, he's going to take it in hand, and we we're happy it about out. it, but it has turned out. Those who know were well, not. I wasn't. Those yeah. who know were not. Yeah. At this series of interviews, I said, no, he has to let it go. Because the bottom line is, Obasa just did the same thing. Yes. So what they do is that that is, that is, that is, that is where the action is. Mm -hmm. So everybody wants it. When Obasa was on his way, that was when he now brought in Rewano Lukman. Mm. So when people also started talking that, Mr. President, this may be too much, then he now had Minister for State for Petroleum. Mm -hmm. And then he now gave the Minister of State for Petroleum also the position of JMD. And the union Pengerson kicked against it. Mm -hmm. I know my sister called me and said, this, I said, no, that is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. You can't be both JMD. Mm -hmm. And then that means, as a minister, you are a poli that's a political office. Yes. And then as a GMD, you run the day-to-day -day affairs. Yeah, yeah. So how do you Europe combine these two? So the union fought it, and later the president also now had to split that office. Mm -hmm. So when you talked about somebody says when he becomes president, this is what he's going to do, I've heard people also say that in the past. Mm 
Because there's one thing is, I always say the battle for the president of Nigeria is actually the battle for who controls the oil and gas. So whatever favors you want to dispense, it comes from there. Mm. So you said when you heard that the president had appointed himself the minister, minister of petroleum, you as a industry insider knew that was not going to be a good idea, even though there was applause from yes. the general public. And also, obviously, you knew some of the unintended consequences yes. of what this meant. What role did the union take in actually speaking out? Of no, the union, did, the union did that. Of course, the union can only, you see, we always have this saying that in, in the union, the first thing we do, the union always look after itself. Mm. That's the first reason. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we did the 2012 uh, strike on the street, and people were like, oh, the union, they've just betrayed Nigerians and whatever. And this person I told people, I said, the first reason, I was, well, yeah, I was, exactly I was elected. Yeah. First, for you to be a Pengasi president or a TUC president, you must have a job. Mm -hmm. So first, I have a job with oil and gas. Mm -hmm. And I was elected by my colleagues. Mm -hmm. So my first responsibility is to my colleagues. Yes. They pay the dues. They make sure the president, whether you are flying anywhere, they train you. Mm -hmm. I told them, they send me to the best schools in the world. Now, at the end of the day, you, are, you don't pay any dues. You don't solve, the union doesn't lean on mm -hmm. you. And the next thing, you want to dictate to the union what they should do. No, the union won't take it. So the first thing is that the union will cry out that this is not done properly. If Nigerians don't do anything about it, then the union will, in the union, they do what they call, you now play defense, which is you defend your turf. Mm -hmm. And which means you will make sure none of your members will lose any job as a result. Mm. Okay. So the distrust between the unions and the go and government continues to grow. Mm -hmm. It will grow. It, it's, al it's always going to be there, just like that of the tongue and the teeth. Mm. Because we always have this saying that, uh, first, we need to always make sure what is good for the society, the union will always talk about it. But if society has not grow to the consciousness of understanding what the union is saying, mm. the union take a backstage and make sure its members keep their job. Mm. Well, which is what you guys have done. Yeah. What do you make of the government's in that, well, unwillingness to enforce mm. the audits of NMPC's accounts? Well, when government does that, I think it's still, ordinarily, if you want to audit an NPC's account, mm -hmm. you don't, that, that's not something we should even be discussing. Mm -hmm. It's normal for any organization to be audited. Mm -hmm. So if, if an organization is not audited, then you have issues around it. The, the, the first was uh, the federation account, the accountant general of the federation, uh, the cardinal audit of several parastatals. And the findings were mind boggling. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that audit does is not that you are going to come up and say, punish A, punish B. The first thing is that this is where we are. How do we improve it? How do we improve corporate governance? How do we make sure that things are done in line with our laws? How do you improve the procurement processes? Because most of the challenges we face are first issue of procurement. And that's why you see, even listening to their English language, the English words that our governors use, mm -hmm. you will be shocked. Mm -hmm. The governor says, hey, we are not going to pay or we'll fire workers. You can't say that in the U.S. You can't say that mm -hmm. in the U.K. You know you lose the next election. Mm -hmm. yes. Politicians yes. are at their best behavior when it's close to election. Mm -hmm. Nigerian politicians are even at their worst when it's close to election. So sometimes I'm asking, is there something they know about the election mm -hmm. that we don't know? Yes, to account for such impunity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. You start asking yeah. yourself, is there something there? They are going to do that. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That is, um, that is heavy. That is very yeah. heavy. When you, I mean, when you look at sort of, now we're going into the next administration, we're going to into elections, and you look at people, as people make their choices, what are some of the things that, you, I mean, because one of the things we want people to do is start to make very informed choices, empowered choices. What are the things that people need to know about the oil and gas sector that you believe they don't know, and they need to look for the candidate that would deliver that? First thing, what are you looking at for? I always say, how do you want to live your life? You have to start from that premise. How do you want to live your life? What do you want to see in your life? I have four kids. So what I have expectation for my children is that first, it doesn't have to do with looking at the oil and gas. First of all, you have to, all, those are, all those are secondary. Mm -hmm. You know, there are fundamentals. You have an idea of this is the school. This is the kind of school I want my kids to go to. This is the healthcare I want to see available. This is the kind of transportation system. Why are people talking about minimum wage today? Ordinarily, why should we be talking about minimum wage? Why should we? Now you are going to look at, you know how much it will cost you in a month in the UK because transport system is heavily subsidized. It's because today is Saturday. When I left my house to come here, 
If it was on a weekday, there's no way I would get here for this program. Okay. Yes, but there is, there is only single means of transportation. Yes. So what people should be asking themselves is, who is going to offer you that? And not just somebody coming up to say, I will offer you free health care. I will offer you free education. You need to ask him how. How will you pay for this? Yeah. How will you pay for it? It seems mm -hmm. to be coming up a lot mm -hmm. more. So basically what you are saying is that we need yes. to begin to hold those in power responsible or those who are willing to come into a political uh, office to serve the people. Yes. We need to be asking them questions that are going to help them identify mm -hmm. how is, they're going to get And this is also where the media comes in. Yes. It's not just somebody come to the studio and you start giving him some soft questions. Mm -hmm. Ask him how. Where are you going to get the money? Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes somebody says, this is what I'll do with oil and gas. We produce two million barrels. They'll tell you two million barrels per day. But you and I know we've never hit two million barrels mm -hmm. in a long time. Mm -hmm. So we are between 1.5 and 1.9 mm -hmm. every, every day. So how many of that? Sometimes the Nigeria says, oh, we are making so much money from crude oil. If it goes for, as at yesterday, it's less than $70 a barrel. So you calculate all of that. The operators get a certain share of that money. So how much goes to the government? How much goes to the federal government? How much goes to the state government? What is it, IGRO of each state? So if you get the IGRO, how much are you paying? A governor said he can't pay 30,000 naira, and I know that 40% of the governor's wage bill are political office holders. Yes. And then when they are going, somebody, I'll give an example of a special advisor in a particular state. When he's leaving, he gets 26 million after four years as payoff. Yes. So now, is that we now need to go into all of this. And then, like I was talking to some of my colleagues, and I said, I don't think the strategy that they, were, they have also employed, I don't think, I think labor was very soft with this government. Mm -hmm. Now, why am I saying that? Data. There are three types of people. We were trained that when you want to make, when you want to address people, there are three types of people that you must satisfy. There are those who want to build sky in the moon. It is their way of looking at things. You need to also make them see that. There are those who are very romantic. They want to see everything. You have to also make them see that. And there are those who can only be, who only want to see data, figures, the headgates. So all these three you must satisfy. And then when you have all of that, then you use your data to hold governors and those in authority accountable. You, nobody can fault it. Mm. If I'm giving you these figures now, let the governor come and come and come and counter what I'm saying. So is it your position that Labour took a soft approach yes, I think, by agreeing I, 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 to yes, 30 yes. million? Not just, 30, 30, 000, not, not just 30 thousand. Why I say they took a soft approach is that what I've expected Labour to have is that Labour should have come out openly and picked tent. You see, it's either you are hot or you are cold, yeah. and if you are neither, nobody needs you. So what I expected Labour to do was, first thing was, the governor in uh, Kitty was not paying salaries. Mm. Fayoshi. Labour would have moved in and run a campaign against Fayoshi. And when you do that, the opposition party will accuse you. The APC will be happy that you are doing that in their favor. Mm -hmm. Now, what you've done is strategic. Then, a month or two later, it was turned for Oshun State. So you cannot also move into a shoe okay. and campaign against the APC. So I think what you're saying is that there wasn't sort of like a, the, the role of oversight, which is what lab, labor unions are yes. supposed to do, and yeah. represent their their constituency. They sort of let out. They sort of left. I think that I think they were they were too soft, probably too trusting of the government. Mm -hmm. I you don't know? think there's it was trust. I think they just sort of. Yeah. I'm not sure there's a lot of trust between the government yeah. and the there, labor union. Is there union. a precedent for this sort of lobbying movement mm -hmm. that you're suggesting? During an election yes, campaign. Yes, I did. I did that. What happened was I campaigned for Mimico because Mimico, I, I negotiated 18,000 naira. So Mimico agreed to pay 18,000 naira. So when he was going for election, I campaigned for Mimico. So that it is. So you campaigned based on the fact that he delivered yes, what he, he was, said he yes. would. Mm -hmm. So that didn't go that way with the president. And then the next thing, the president saw me campaigning for Oshomale, which was then ACN and later APC. And then you also now saw, and I also had to campaign for Roti Miyamichi, then in the PDP. So now they couldn't play, you, they can't place you. Mm -hmm. So which means they've been able to see that you've identified your interest, mm -hmm. and then you go after your interest. So at the end of the day, I also now had to take on the president by going on TV to say, if we have an agreement and the president is not sticking to the agreement, I can't trust this president. I said that live on TV. And that didn't sit well with the president. And then the next day they called for a meeting. I want to call for this meeting. 
18,000 naira final that the president had already approved. It was in the Ministry of Finance seated there. So it was approved, and, and that's it. But it's, it doesn't have to do with the fact that you belong to X party, you don't belong. It's identify your interest. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, um, as we wrap up, someone, I mean, someone with that on the, you're on the oil and gas, you're in the oil and gas sector, you understand the dynamics of the mm. price of oil over the last few years. You understand the dynamics of what's happening in Nigeria over the last few years. What's your opinion of the latest number we've come to with, uh, for minimum wage? Mm -hmm. First is, in negotiating minimum wage, you have to look at statistics, you have to look at both former and informal sector. Mm -hmm. And you have to look at, if we go, the original thing Labour was asking for was 60,000. Mm -hmm. But we have to look at, okay, how many people are likely going to lose their job if you do 60,000? Mm -hmm. Not in the public sector. Mm -hmm. the, the lady at the gas station, mm -hmm. you know, the, the house help, mm -hmm. because it's going to affect mm -hmm. everybody. It has a trickle down yes, effect. Yes, it has a trickle down effect. Yeah. So we now had to look at all of that. That was why we came to 18 at that time, and that also informed why they are doing 30,000. 30, because if you look at inflation, if you look at the cost of, I mean, the, the oil revenue that has also had, has significantly plummeted in the last few years. Yeah. I mean, if we were in uh, over 100, now we're in the 60 to 70 range for the last few years. So all these things have effects because it affects how much money Nigeria makes. When you look at, when you look at inflation today and you look at the cost of it takes to run your home, I mean, you, you said you have four kids, and you look at the new minimum wage, the 30,000. What is your, I mean, what message do you have for the Nigerian the, worker? The first thing is, the first thing is, what I see the Nigerian worker doing at the moment is that they're just treading water. It's, it's not as if that 30,000 naira is going to be enough for it's everybody. Not. But what normally happens is that once you face a minimum wage at 13,000 naira, it's a benchmark. Yes, it's, so it's, there are, it's, there, are, it's, there, are yeah. there are movements that will happen. Take, for example, a governor of those state is already paying He's ready to pay 30,000 naira. So what he's paying at the moment is almost there. Mm -hmm. So now what you have is that you're going to have, if somebody was earning 50,000 naira before, mm -hmm. it's possible to get a percentage, it gets a percentage yeah. increase. So that is also what we are looking out for. But there are other areas that I think what the government is doing, they're even not thinking out of the box. What I expect the government to do is if you are in a negotiation, you can make an offer. What kind of offer are you making? If you come to me, I'll give an example. I was negotiating with somebody who worked for me. I had to change my driver. And they gave me a figure that I'm going to pay. And I told the driver, OK, I'm not going to pay you this figure, but this is what I'm going to guarantee you. You eat every day. I provide one meal for you every day. Mm -hmm. And the guy looked at that one meal is almost 30,000 mm -hmm. naira every day. Mm -hmm. So when he looked at that, then he jumped at it. So now I have looked at it that, OK, fine, providing that meal, I can get the meal from the house, which comes in. Mm -hmm. So it makes it easier for my pocket. Mm -hmm. And also make the guy happy. So mm -hmm. what government is not doing, they're not making any offer. Mm -hmm. To say, OK, workers, if I'm in their shoes, OK, workers, this is why I can't pay you X amount of money, but I'm going to guarantee you free health care. Mm -hmm. OK, this is why I can't pay you this. I'm going to guarantee you your kids free education. Mm -hmm. That is what they do. But it doesn't wake up and say, hey, we can't have money. When I know that we are talking about $325 million we recently discovered in the bank, another $2.2 .2 billion mm -hmm. energy dividend, nobody mm -hmm. knew how the money was expended. We, well, which we is why so we don't have an audit. Yeah, yes. Yes. exactly. So there's so much. There's so much that is <laughs> making the worker not want, we don't want to listen to anybody. Mm -hmm. And it inspired, my own appeal to government is that, is in their own enlightened self-interest. Yeah. Things like this happen in other parts of the world, but there is an enlightened self-interest that when your neighbor has something to look up to, that way you can also enjoy whatever you have. But if he has nothing to look up to, someday is coming for yours. Yeah. Thank you so much for being You're here. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much.